Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Quality, Data Engineering, and Data Science. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen or via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you today our speakers, Tom Redman, a.k.a. the Data Doc at Data Quality Solutions, and Prashant Southakal, the Managing Principal at DBP Institute. Tom helps companies, including many of the Fortune 100, improve data quality. For those that follow his innovative approaches, enjoy the many benefits of a far better data, including far lower costs. Tom's data-driven profiting from your most important business asset, published by Harvard Business Press in 2008, is the guiding light for companies thinking to build their future in data. Tom started his career at Bell Labs, where he led the Data Quality Lab. He has a PhD in statistics and two patents. Prashant is the managing principal of DBP uh, Institute, the data, uh, data monetization firm which monetizes business data for insights, compliance, and customer service. He brings over 20 years of data and information management experience, consulting working for companies such as SAP AG, Shell, Apple, P&G, and General Electric in North America, Asia, and Europe. He has presented scholarly works in uh, IEE journals and conferences, and so Dr. Southcall has published three books, including the recent data for business performance. So with that, let me turn it over to our speakers for today to get to today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Shannon. That's a very kind introduction, and and I'm very much looking forward to to this webinar. The um, I say that, and now I oh here we go. The um, we're we're at a really really interesting time in the data space. I mean, let's face it. For most of us, being in the in the data business has been a tough career. But it's finally good to be a data person, right? There's there's a lot of good things going on in in all areas. At the same time, progress in many respects seems a lot slower than we think it should be. And 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 we need to speed up. And and one of the ways that we need to speed up is is to really challenge each other very, very hard and the interplay of in particular of what works in practice and frameworks and, and being very, very broad, um, understanding where businesses are going, how we can help them go there faster, where we need to vector them, where we need to build more data in. And, and so I'm pleased to be, to be working with Prashant for the last couple of years. We've really gotten into this, into this habit of, of challenging each other very, very hard. Some days I, I get off the phone with him and I think, oh my goodness, I've been too brutal. And I, and I think every now and then he may feel the same way. So what we thought we'd do in this webinar today is, is, is we'll look at this locus of, of data quality, data engineering, and science. At, at the union of those things, we'll have an open-ended ended discussion and we'll try to push each other very hard our prep for this, we kind of said, okay, Prasant, let me ask you the five questions I really would most like to ask you, and, and you ask me the five you'd most like to ask me. And, and so that was sort of the structure of this presentation. And as we go along, we'll, we'll feel free to, to challenge each other right, right from the beginning. Uh, one quick shout out, and, and that is, I'm sorry, the slides just went away. One quick shout out, and, and if you haven't seen this thing called the, the data, the leader's data manifesto, I've, I've just put the slide up for the leader's data manifesto. Uh, I think most people in, in the data community have seen this by now, but, but please, if you haven't done so, go to www.dataleaders.org and 
and take a look. This this manifesto is is the result of a collaboration by you know people whose names you see in the the lower left of the slide: Ladley, McGilvery, O'Neill, uh, Nina Evans, and uh, Jim's Price, and and myself to really get at this question of why are we moving so slowly and and what do we need to speed up and. It's less than a thousand words. It's, it, it's the best summary I know of, of what anybody, you know, no matter who you are, how you can contribute to, to things speeding up. So with that, uh, let's charge off. Prasant, I believe you have the first question. Yeah. Um, as Hi, uh, Tom. So thanks uh, very much for the good introduction. And same with you, Shannon. It was uh, nice to talk a few lines about me. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, so while we have some things to share, we are also looking at uh, at your questions and thoughts so that we all learn from each other. Um, so, uh, Tom, um, the first question for you is um, you have been trained as a statistician and uh, and worked in Bell Labs uh, for J.P. Morgan and other big companies. Uh, and you have worked on the data quality for a very long time. Uh, let me ask you a question that uh, that tries to merge these two things. Um, how do the quality needs for data analytics differ from the more usual needs that we see in day-to-day -day operations? Yes. So, so that's a good question. I, I, I put up the slide. I, I, I want to answer that question by, by first establishing a baseline. And and, and the baseline is, is looking at, you know, data quality day in and day out. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, the, the story is turning out to be far worse than, than uh, you know, we, we, we imagined it was even a couple of years ago. I, I'd like people to concentrate on the first two bullet items. The best estimate is that 45% of newly created data records have a critical error in them. There's, there's a particular way, we, I've done this study, I've done it with some, some, some people in Ireland, and, and we teach a class there, and we've gotten a, a large group of, of people in many databases, many companies and so forth, to take a, to peer in on stuff they're using today. And, and the most important stuff, the newest stuff, and and um, and finding out the, uh, you know the uh, incredible range, right from a few percent to a, to a few in the high 90s. But on average, 45 percent of the newly created data records having at least one critical error in them. And the cost is enormous. I mean, you can't do work with errors in the data. You have to fix it up before you can go on. And and um, and that's where these things called hidden data factories come in. The um, IBM published a figure not too long ago that said the cost in the U.S. economy of, of this was uh, $3.1 trillion per year. That's sort of, you know, on the order of 18% of, of the economy. The 20% uh, of revenue figure that I've cited here is, um, is from an Experian study. I believe it was conducted last year. Uh, so there's some good work going on in, in Australia led to by Martin Spratt. You know, this number, about 20% of, of revenue or the cost of bad data, is, is, is there's a lot of, 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 of support for that now. And, and these two numbers go hand in hand. So, so the baseline is, is pretty darn bad. Now, now in data science, it's, it's, it's what we don't yet have as good a picture. The, the, um, first of all, I mean, the impact may be different. In, in data quality, in, in day in and day out operations, okay, you have one piece of data, it's wrong, so it means you send the package the wrong place, or you don't order enough of the, the, the blue uh, size medium v-neck sweaters, or, or, or that kind of thing. The errors uh, are, 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 are contained. In data science, it, it may be very different. First of all, you, you, you could have errors to pair of errors that, in effect, cancel each other out, and, and there's, there's no cost. And uh, unfortunately, we don't really know when, when those situations is, um, and, and, but some of the time, there, there won't be the same kind of, kind of error. But, but in other times, the, the, um, 
the situation can can be so much worse. And and in in other words, that bad data can lead to a bad decision or a bad prediction that, that impacts thousands of people. I think the financial crisis was very much much rooted in in um, in bad data. And, and um, and today, you know, one of the things we're really excited about, and rightly so, is is this notion of of, of uh, artificial intelligence, and um, and and so again, I mean, we really don't fully understand the impact, but at least potentially, the bad data can lead to to bad algorithms, and 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 then those algorithms just cascade, and and the damage is is potentially un, unlimited. So so that's the most important. The most important things. The, I mean, it's also true that you know we have other problems in in data science. So we've got data, you know, diff, different data sources with slightly different definitions that, that we need to align to do good data science. And and we also have the problem of of convincing decision makers that the data can be trusted. And so you know, nothing's worse than sort of doing a great job on on data quality and having trusted data and coming up with some great insight. And then the decision maker says, "No, don't trust it. We're not going to do it." Um, so, so we really, I mean, this is, I, I, I think, people in the data community, if you're at all interested in, in in data, you really have to 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 refocus on on data quality. The the potential, the damage is just enormous, and and everything we hold, you know, good and dear in terms of going forward. Around data science, you know, things could just get so much worse. So, Prasant, I, I'm prattling on a, a, a little bit. I mean, the uh, I, I now want to ask you a question. And and look, no secret, you wrote this book, data data for business performance. And, and and I have two questions. I mean, the first is broadly in your analysis, are are you finding things that are consistent with what I said about about data quality? And, and then maybe, you know, can you spend no more than 30 seconds or a minute telling us a little bit more about the book? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. So uh, what I wrote in the book is very much in line with, uh, with what you have said. Um, so in, in this regard, there are three things which, have, uh, which, have, uh, which make this book different from uh, other books or uh, what I have uh, presented here. Uh, the, the first thing is the book is holistic. So when you look at uh, data, most of the things when data, uh, when people talk about data, it is considered very synonymous to BI or analytics. But I've gone a step forward. I said data can be a function of two things. One is, of course, for decision making through insights or analytics. It can be also used for compliance, uh, for your uh, for your laws and regulations, for your internal security policies, and all those things. And finally, data is also used for operations, like for your customer service, whether it's the internal customers or external customers. So when I say data for business performance, it is where I look at three main dimensions, and that's uh, and that's one reason why I believe it is holistic. Uh, the second point is it is uh, this book is and written way, most. I just I just want to get you to emphasize this. I mean, this is something we get lost. The people use data every day, right? Um, and and sometimes you know we're thinking about the future, and and lose sight of yeah. Well, we've actually got to order the right number of sweaters. And we've actually got to deliver packages to people, right? Um, we've actually got to decide where we're going to drill the well. We've got to decide where we're going to put this, you know, where we're going to put this feature in, in into a software product. So, I mean, all those require enormous amounts of data. So, excuse the interruption, but I'm correct there, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 absolutely. So, I've, all those points we which I've raised is more from a practical standpoint, and that's, this is where uh, this book is more for uh, practitioners. The statistics, which says that the, you know mostly about the poor quality of data and all those things. That's true. That's very important. But this book talks more about the uh, more about prescriptions. You know, it's great that uh, there is a cost of poor data quality, but what can you do for, uh, to uh, to manage it or to reduce that uh, number or to make uh, uh, or you transform your data to a business asset. Uh, those kind of things, and finally, uh, we have a lot of books on um, on SAP, on Tableau, and R, and uh, so many other technologies. So this book, while it looks at all these uh, technologies as examples, this is generally a technology agnostic book. 
So whether you are working in uh, day to day in SAP BI or Bob J, or whether you are writing data visualization reports using Tableau, or whether you're writing R scripts, so this book is applicable. So yeah. So one of the things, <laughs> what, one of the things that I never understood, and and until until we started talking about it, is is a lot of people make a big distinction between master data and reference data. And, you know, there's this data and that data, structured data, unstructured data. I, I know, I know you explain this in the book. I mean, what, what's the big deal? Why is this? Why is this so important? Hmm. Uh, um, yeah, excellent question. Like uh, people, uh, mostly uh, people try to classify data as uh, structured and unstructured. I don't dispute it. It is true. You can classify data as structured and unstructured. But I also classify data from the business point of view into three plus one uh, uh, types of data. The, the first thing is about the reference data, which is primarily about the business category, like which country you operate in, which currency you, uh, you do your business with, uh, what, what are the plants in which you have your factories on. Uh, so those are the kind of things which are classified, which can categorize your business, and I call them as reference data. Then master data, as most of you would be knowing, it's primarily about the business entity. Uh, such as your customers, your vendors, your GL accounts, uh, your even concepts such as contracts and warranties can be pretty much classified as master data. And uh, finally, the transaction data, which I call it as uh, data about, which is pretty much the time series data, which is about business events or business transactions, like uh, purchase orders, uh, sales uh, cycles, uh, even payroll runs, uh, invoices, all those things which are pretty much a function of time, I call them as transaction data. And the common thing that binds everything, or these three types of data, is the metadata or the data dictionary, which defines, oh, this is the primary key, this is the field land, this is the field type, uh, all those kind of things. So uh, what I thought was, from a business point of view, classifying data as reference master and transaction data is more appropriate to if somebody wants to derive the, uh, somebody wants to govern data, somebody wants to get the value out of data. So I have gone, while I have not disputed the, <laughs> Structured and unstructured data, but I've I've, I've explained uh, this concept in detail. Uh, so, what's uh, the what, what? Why does somebody who doesn't have data in their title care? You still there, Prasant? Yes, uh, I'm there. Uh, so, uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, Tom. Uh, so, if you look at uh, the, the, the example of a business data is not that the reference data or the transaction data or even master data are standalone entities which are sitting in one uh, table in a, in, within the database. So they all come together. Like let's take, uh, I took a screenshot from, uh, from an SAP purchase order. And if you look at a purchase order, for example, it has got uh, reference data such as your currency, whether it is order type, which can also, which can all, which are pretty much the drill down in when it comes to reports. Uh, it has got master data elements such as the vendor master, the item. And finally, it has got all the transaction data with the numbers, even the purchase order number, which is generated when, when you click on submit or the submit to uh, the transaction. Now, it has got the prices, it has got the quantity. Everything which is a function of time is transaction data. Uh, so it, this is the practical significance of uh, the three types of data. Behind this, there is the metadata, of course. So uh, classifying this would help us govern the data better, manage it better, and uh, and uh, even some of the things about data governance, line of business versus enterprise, can help us classify this better. So I, I want to build on this because I think this is a really important point, and 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 it, and it has practical significance that 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 you know all of us really need to understand. I, I mean, I, I I like to use a lot of analogies that don't have anything to do with with data and. And the analogy I got out of this slide, when you first showed me this slide that came to mind, was a pencil, right? And you know that simple pencil, lead pencil that that you know that everybody uses every day, and and um, you know and 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 I don't know, a hundred of them cost like you know two dollars to make or something like that. But you know the, the the point was made that the pencil is simple as it is is so complex that nobody understands everything needed to to go into it. And there's things about the graphite, there's things about the wood, there's painting it, there's putting a little metal clasp on it, there's an eraser, da-da-da-da-da-da. 
Okay, and 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 so here here is as about as simple as it gets on this slide in terms of, of, of business data. Yet it's sort of like that pencil, right? The transactional data came from one place. The reference data came from a different place. The master data came from somebody else setting up the master the master record with the vendor. Underneath this is the metadata, right? So so it seems to me that, you know, like to make a pencil, a lot of things have to go right. And what you're really saying is, is that to use data effectively, a lot of things have to go right. It, 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 and, and, and that's why, you know, somebody who doesn't have data in their title needs to know about this. Is, do you agree with that? Agreed, absolutely true. Okay. Um, you know, you, 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 we mentioned unstructured versus structured. I, I don't want to spend too too long on this slide, but but I, I guess I hear these stats that sort of you know only 30% of the structured data is being used, and less than 1% of the unstructured data is being used. And you know, and it seems to me that that then you know people are worrying about spending a lot of time worrying about data lakes and and on and on and on. And, and so you know like. Like, what's the big deal here? Why, why shouldn't we be, you know, focusing solely on the most important stuff and, and really almost all of that is structured? Hmm. Yeah, so, so coming to the definition, for instance, let's uh, sort, sort this out. The first thing is uh, the structured data is uh, when during the time of data origination where there is a pre I can't hear you now, Prasad. What makes the data, whether it's a customer or a structured data. However, you can even uh, classify this customer as unstructured data uh, by putting it something like a Procter & Gamble uh, Brussels, for example, and, um, and call it as unstructured data and uh, classify it as unstructured data. But the point, the key point is the unstructured data is is about uh, according to me, of course, <laughs> it's about the, the taxonomy. So it's, uh, it is a taxonomy which is going to, uh, which, which really matters when you want to derive value out of this unstructured data. So, uh, Tom, if you go to the next uh, slide. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the description, for example, which uh, of this item, uh, items which you see. So pretty much there is a taxonomy to classify this uh, ball bearing. Uh, so, but there could be a kind of an aberration or a deviation from the taxonomy that has defined, and that is where there could be a potential uh, loss of opportunity if somebody wants to derive value out of unstructured data. True, as Tom, as you just said, 80% uh, of the data that is created is unstructured. Great. So we have now mechanisms or technologies to capture this unstructured data. But the point here is that if you don't have the right taxonomy defined. So that uh, to harness this unstructured data, then pretty much what you are capturing would might end up as a waste of time and effort. So, what I uh, bottom line is uh, taxonomy and, un and unstructured data go hand in hand. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Tom, uh, so then let me ask you a, a question here. Uh, you have emphasized a lot on putting the uh, data to work, like making data practical or spreading the data. Uh, tell us more about where the data science fits in the big picture. Um, okay. Yeah, this, this, this is something I, I, I spend a, a, a lot of my time uh, thinking about. And, and uh, you know, to, uh, personally, I, I think we're at the, at the early stages of a, of a data revolution that, you know, is this fundamental is people coming off farms and, and uh, and moving into factories, I, I you know I, I I think that this business of 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 putting data to work is 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 um you know is 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 really really important, and and we need to get better at practically everything we do. I mean we need to get better at the day in and day out work, and and I've already complained about the impact of quality on that. You know we we need to get better at management and, and planning, and uh, frankly I don't know how some people run their companies with, 
with the quality of, of reporting they, 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 they have now. We need to, you know, get better at predictions so we can do plan. But, but, but I, 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 I think the heart of, of the, data, the data revolution is, is all about, if you work for a for-profit company, it, it's about putting data to work. And, and largely to make money and, and, um, and, and doing it in new and exciting ways. And, and for me, the, the data science portion of it is, is figuring out what those new and, and important ways are. As I said, look, everybody knows that if you use more data, you can reduce uncertainty and make better decisions. And, and, and so, so the you know so let's just you know take a typical decision and and it's hard to measure uncertainty but let's say you know today the uncertainty is 57 percent and and wouldn't it be great if tomorrow we could make it so the uncertainty is 56 percent and and two weeks from now so that it's 55 percent you just continually get better at this right wouldn't it be better if we could continually think of ways to informationalize products and and, and, and I guess, you know, so I, I think of like Uber as, as an informationalizer and, 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 and I want everyone to just think about, you know, what, it, what Uber did was they, they, they took a process of, of, of getting a cab, right, and, and they combined two pieces of, of data that hadn't been combined before. One was I'm looking for a ride with I'm looking for a fare, and, and just two pieces of data, and they, they upset the entire, the entire uh, and, and the entire business, right? And, and, and there's plenty of ways to, to you know, other ways to, to put data to work. I don't want to go through the list here, but I do want to mention one other concept, and, and that is, is this thing in Strategy 101, right? That, you know, if you, if you took Strategy 101 in, in business school or whatever, I think, you know, lesson number one would be have something that other people don't. And and in, in the data space, that means proprietary data, right? Stuff we have that nobody else has. And so, you know, sorting out how we're gonna, how we're gonna get that stuff and we're gonna protect it and we're gonna leverage it, you know, that to me is, is data science too, right? So, so data science for me is, is, is very, very broad and very much, um, Directed at, at at the new revenue kinds of things, or at the sort of you know big cost reduction kinds of things. Now, uh, Prasant, me back at you. Um, you've talked about you know doing data engineering before data science. Oh, excuse me, I I I I, I failed to to talk about this slide, which is my slide. I mean, this whole business of of putting data to work. I mean, I guess I think of it as an end-to-end -end process, and and you can see the four steps there. But look, it's not enough to have good data. You got to you got to do the discovery. You got to figure out how you're going to deliver it in terms of a a product or service or report, and you got to just just figure out how you're going to do so at profit to do so. And and um, and data science per se is 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 this big big stuff in the discovery that goes with any way that I just mentioned to, to put, put uh, data science, uh, put data to work. Now, excuse me for getting ahead of myself, but Prasant, I, I really want to get to this question for you, is, is, is you emphasize data engineering before data science, okay? Can you tell me about that? Why is that? What's so important about this? Hmm. So uh, Tom, taking where you left, uh, like the the the, uh, the, the D four uh, process from uh, uh, which you mentioned in the previous slide. So if you look at this slide, which I call it as uh, the data life cycle, right from the time the data is originated, which might be originated through machines or it might be originating through the person's mind, to the time it is captured in the in the system, uh, it's been validated, processed, and finally it's been distributed, say for instance, the data is the same business process, is managed in two different systems, in two different geographies. How do you integrate it together? And uh, finally you aggregate it by all the BI stuff, cubes and everything. Before the discovery or the interpretation and the consumption, which is, uh, which is pretty much your dollars uh, aspect in the previous slide, happens. So if you look at the top two uh, bars, the data security and data storage, it is pretty much, I call it as an IT function. 
whereas the ones in the middle, all the chevrons, are pretty much the, the business function. Though IT might be playing a big role in those. So the, the first thing is, uh, you know, why data engineering is so important. So before you before you uh, uh, get your dollars through interpretation and consumption, there is a bunch of activities which you need to do right from the time the data is originated till the time data is aggregated, so that uh, the decision makers or rather the business can interpret the data and um, and make appropriate decisions. So that uh, basically eight out of ten steps in the data life cycle are are pertaining to the, the data uh, the data engineering. So yeah, so that's one reason why I believe uh, they are the, 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 the data um, engineering aspect is fundamental or one of the first steps when it uh, goes towards data science or analytics. So and there's go, a lot of... If I go back to this slide for a minute, this thing I call yeah. data, it's almost like it's D1. Well, obviously D1 comes before D2, which is the data science. And what you're saying is, is let's break D1 down. And, and there's and, and these things we need to do to D1, you know, now that's D1, A, B, da 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 da, are all these are all these eight things, right? And Correct. and and and, you're, and and how well you do with these things places a strict upper bound on how well you can do with later steps in that end end process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So so now, but so but now, I mean, this this leads to the question is. Is is data engineering the same as cleaning? Um, in, in my view, it is not. So the data engineering is more than data cleansing. So based on what I said in the previous slide, I just captured those blue chevrons and put it here, right from origination to aggregation. And this whole uh, steps, set of steps, I call it as data engineering. And data as data validation is is one part of data engineering is one component within data engineering so what exactly happens here what is data validation or what exactly data cleansing is so this is primarily about uh, data formatting uh, it could be even for unstructured data it could be making sure that the, it's in the right taxonomy it could be even uh, removing duplicates annually or through a routine yeah. It could be even enhancing the cardinality of the data set. So these are all the steps which you need to do as part of the data cleansing activity or, the, or data validation, which is one of the fundamental steps of data engineering. So, so the data uh, engineering is not data cleansing. It's much more than that. And uh, data cleansing is an important pillar within data engineering. I, I mean, I guess, I, I, I guess you'd probably agree that if you do a good job in origination, Right, you'd like to build as much quality into origination as you can, right, and be doing as little validation and, and, and correction as, as, as you possibly can, right? I mean, you know, there's organizations that spend 80% of their time doing, doing validation, and that's because they do such a bad job at origination, right? Correct. And so, yeah. so the point is, 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 is data engineering, you want to be broad with it, right? And, and you still got to go through these steps, but you want to do them as smartly as you possibly can. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, but data origination is an important step. One of the... Rashant, I can't hear you right now. Shannon, can you hear Prasant? I cannot. Prasant, Prasant I don't know what happened. Um, there is a phone number we can get you in on. So, so Shannon. Well, so tell me when to continue on the stream of thought there, and I will bring Prashant back and see what I can do there. Yes, our apologies to uh, to attendees for this. Um, let me uh, let me go to the, the the next slide, and um, 
And the next two things that we wanted to talk about were sort of around this business of, of organizing in the right way to, to do good data science. And and um, and 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 so so I'm going to I'm going to split this in into two slides. The first is is this question comes up all the time, and that is 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 where do the data scientists sit? And 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 there's arguments about you know putting them off 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 on their own, or there's arguments about putting them them close in the business. And um, and most of those arguments. A, kind of assume a, a one-size-fits-all answer, and and I, I've not found that useful at all. I I, I think you know it's, if this is another one of these uh, form fits function, it depends on what you're trying to do. And and so, so the sense of this slide is is well, what you know, imagine a continuum, and on one end of the continuum, you're looking to do you know, to do basic process improvements. I mean, you may be simple BI stuff, right? You know, day in and day out stuff on the line, in the, in the line. And and then on the other end of the continuum is, is, is you're looking to make fundamental new discoveries. What, whatever your industry's equivalent of the discovery of the Higg boson is, you know, you're trying to do that. And, and of course, this is a continuum. So, so you know, I, I put this thing called new sophisticated algorithms in 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 the um, you know on t more towards the fundamental discovery. You know, maybe you're, you're you're you you do credit reporting and you're looking for new algorithms for for doing that. I suppose we could also you know you're parameterizing an old algorithm and and so forth. So, but it's very very clear that that, that the stuff that in the line that, that the basic process improvement stuff it's a you ought to be doing that data science in the line, and you ought to be getting as many people involved in it in it as you can, right? So, so whatever your your group is, is is it ought to sit with, ideally with, and maybe not you know with, but as close to people who are who are doing day in and day out um, work as as needed. Now, you know, to the degree that you're really seeking a, a fundamental new discovery, you really need a separate organization to do that. You really need to do that in a lab. And and, there, and there's lots and lots of reasons for that. I mean, it just turns out that <clears throat> that the harder the problem, the, the, the more forward thinking it is, the, 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 the more it requires diverse data sources and, and so forth, the, 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 the more the responsibility to, or the more the, the need to set up an organization specifically Dedicated to 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 that discovery, and then of course you know things like new sophisticated algorithms. Well, you know not in the line per se. There's there's too much discovery to be done, but not as detached from from the line as as a as a laboratory may be. The um, the, the other concept here of, of this data data lab and. And the data factories, I find that you know, like like you know, the good old-fashioned Edison Labs is is a tremendous example of, of of what you need to do. But you know, if you're really looking to 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 you know, new discovery, new products, new services, and so forth, right? You know, you do set that up as a lab. You know, different kinds of management, a different mindset, different people, different kind of goals, and and so forth. But but the lab is not there. To turn a discovery in, into something that you deliver at scale, under great control, and at great profit, right? I think people in the lab are less worried about security and how you'll provide a help desk and and those kinds of things. And so the analogy is 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 is, is you do discovery in 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 the lab, you, you know, <coughs> production in the factory, and 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 you take you know, great, great, um, you take great, go to great lengths to make sure the two are connected. The, um, the Edison, Edison works that I mentioned, you know, the lab and the factory were on, on the same campus. And in some respects, the spirit of, you know, one building for the lab, one building for the, for, for, for the uh, factory, but then they're on the same campus. So people are walking back and forth continually. So, see, Prasant, I see you're back online. Is that correct? 
Yes, um, I'm dead. I don't know for uh, so some reason I got disconnected. Yeah. yeah. So, so look, I mean, I, I know you've done a, a, a lot of work in, 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 in these factory kinds of settings, right? Obviously not literally factories, but data factories. Um, can you break that down? Tell us a little bit more about what's needed there. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, you know there could be many prescriptive things as uh, people might say okay to do this uh, how to derive value out of data uh, but the four things which are very close to me uh, uh, which are very close to me or what I have seen in my uh, consulting assignments are uh, number one manage your core business process in your system of record like for example things core business process such as procurement such as your uh, uh, HR. So you are um, uh, asset management, those kind of things which don't vary significantly, which is not really your competitive advantage. So manage them in your system of record, which could be pretty much in most uh, corporate companies could be your ERP. Number two is manage reference and master data using standards. Why standards? Because the reference and master data are typically shared across uh, Tom, can you hear me? Shannon and Tom, can you yep. hear me? Yes, you're yeah. fine. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, the, why standards? Because if you have, if the data is shared, so sharing of the data becomes much easier when it is complying to a standard. There are numerous standards, whether you talk about oil and gas, retail, automotive, so many standards that are available. So, that's the one which is going to give most value for your buck, which helps you reduce cost, which helps improve functionality, which helps you improve your uh, interoperability and portability of data. So try to go with reference and master data with standards. Transactional data, these are pretty much line of business contracts. So there's no, not much you can, do, you, you can do about it. Whereas reference and master data are shared across the enterprise. So these are enterprise data elements. So use standards. The same uh, taking from uh, taking about, talking about standards, then use data integration with standards, whether it could be ESB or SOA. So try to go with standards. Now, nowadays, we are even talking about uh, new technologies such as uh, the, uh, federated data, data virtualization, so which can pretty much uh, help in data integration if you have the right standards. And finally, um, which most of you would, uh, would agree, is data governance is not an IT function. Uh, a few days back, I was, uh, I was talking to one of my friends who happens to be in the business. He's a uh, geophysicist. And, uh, and he told me, hey, I read your article in LinkedIn. You have written something about data. I said, great. Uh, how, how, how did you like it? Oh, I don't read the uh, stuff which are uh, which are uh, directed towards IT. So even today, uh, there are many people who, who still believe that data means it's an IT function. But things are changing. And um, Gartner recently came out with a study saying that um, uh, this year, in, this year rather in 2016, close to 50% of the chief data officers are reporting to the CEOs. So, so that means things are changing, and uh, data governance uh, is trying to, is positioned as a business function in more and more companies. Yeah, all about control in the factory. So, Prasant, we're, we're we're getting near the end of our time to talk, and and time for people to have have questions. I mean, so so look, we're talking, you know, to the data community, and. And, uh, and, and, and of the things we've talked about here, so what are the three most important things, you know, you'd like a, a, a somebody with data in their title to, to really take away? Hmm. So, Tom, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, I'm on 17. Yeah, 17. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's about what I believe is that, um, uh, First of all, there are many definitions of uh, analytics. Uh, if you just Google the definition of analytics from SAP, it's completely different from Microsoft. It's completely different from what SAS is talking about. So I define analytics as using data to answer business questions. So, so in that way, so that, those questions are contextual and they come from the business goal. And, uh, and KPIs are the ones which make sure that the, the, the quality of data and the, and the results that you get out of data are uh, making sense. So that's one, one first point. The second important point is, um, you know, there is no data management endeavor if there is if there is no customer. So find out who your customer is and why you are and what matters to that customer. So uh, so moving to the cloud, 
Yes, uh, just because there is uh, a, uh, server utilization from 7% to 6.3% is not uh, uh, without is not a strong case, a strong business case. And uh, finally, in my view, uh, data quality is not a project. You don't uh, do a six-month project to improve data quality. It's a destination. The cultural aspect has got a significant uh, aspects to it, and it's uh, it's a journey. So it's an uh, it's kind of uh, as long as the business exists, um, there is a journey. So yeah. uh, Tom, yeah. uh, what are what are your uh, what are what's what's your advice to, uh, to us? Yeah, thank you. I I I I think Prasant, you and I are are in the same direction, but but I want to I, I and and I just want to have a a greater sense of urgency for people in in the data space. Um, this business you mentioned on your last slide that you know we're finally getting to where where you know CDOs aren't all reporting into CIOs, right? And, yeah. and but, but but this question of like, well, where should data to report? I think I've been having that discussion, you know, over and over again for for 25 years, right? And and it took you know four or five years for 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 kind of people to sort it out and compare the experience and so forth, but. For, for at least 15 years, anybody who's thought about it very much has decided that data belongs in, in the business space. And, and to me, the fact that we're you know, <laughs> still having that discussion is indicative of, of um, you know, of, of this first bullet item in here, which is, you know, the data space is, is advancing too slowly. And, um, and, and it's time for practitioners to push harder. And then secondly, the data practitioners must take on the tough organizational issues, right? I mean, my view of, of the reason that, you know, so many data groups report into IT and have historically is, is we allowed it to happen. And, and, you know, maybe we didn't have the political capital to change it at the time, but we didn't develop the political capital to, to make it different. Um, so, th so those are my points one and three. And then, and then the second, you know, the last thing I want to say is, is, is everything runs through quality. Um, furthermore, it's, it's the easiest <laughs> way to, to start. It doesn't require advanced technologies, right? Very little lead time in it. You just, you know, step up as a better customer and a de better data creator and, 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 and find and eliminate the, the root causes of error. And, 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 and the money, the, the organizations that have done this even tolerably well, the money that they, they, they save in doing so, and the trust in the data, even more important. You know, those benefits just simply, simply stun. So, so, um, I, uh, so Shannon, we're, we're ready for questions from the audience. And it just occurred to me, Shannon, so look, Prasant and I tried to do this webinar in a, in, in a different way. And, and not today, but if, if people would, you know, let us know, did, did this, did this sort of back and forth and a little bit of pushing each other, you know, did it work or, or did it seem too con contrived, right? You know, should we be doing a little bit more of this? Should we be doing it a little bit less? Please, please let us, you know, please help us with that. So. Well, thank you guys. First of all, I, I can't, uh, I won't speak for the attendees. I think it went um, well uh, in terms of content, you know, despite the, some of the technical issues <laughs> going on. So, you know, technology is always so great as it, when it works. Thanks for all those who were with their patience for that. I'm just so, uh, to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I was sent a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar today. Uh, so just to dive into the attendee questions here um, for you guys, we've got quite a few coming in. You know, um, you, towards the beginning, or t uh, you know, we had a comment come in that said, I would challenge the comment around unstructured data not having much value, it seems. Um, and then, you know, followed up by that is um, some unstructured data may be about some uh, sentiments of people captured in the comment field. Can you p please explain how um, taxonomy, how would taxonomy help to understand and derive insights from such data? So, so I'll take on the first half of that which is the, you know, the value thing. First of all, I mean, I, I, I personally believe that there's enormous potential in, in unstructured data. 
the, the simple fact of the matter is, is very little of it is, is, is actually used to, to create that value. And, and you, you, you know, if something's valuable, but you're only using 1% of it, then, then, then a really good next step might be to try to use, you know, another percent of it, to try to use 2% of it, and, and then 3 and, and, and so forth, right? And, and so I would, and, and, and by the way, I mean, I, I, too many organizations are focused on making more, making more, making more, instead of, okay, you believe this stuff is valuable, you know, and get that 1% up to 2% rather than, you know, just trying to make more. Um, and and I, I'm pretty sure that that advice will, will, will hold up. Um, now, Prasant, can, can you take on the question about taxonomy? Okay, so uh, the, the, the main thing is um, if you are looking at um, if you are looking at unstructured data and deriving the insights out of it, the taxonomy is the, is the main thing that's going to define it. Like for example, in one of the projects which I work for a leading oil and gas company, we decided to use all their products descriptions using the name and modifier standards. Um, and then name modifier and a bunch of attributes, which is defined by standards such as uh, PIDEX, which is for the, since I, this uh, customer happened to be from the oil and gas. So it took some uh, effort to bring uh, all the, the uh, all the data which were, which didn't have any taxonomy to this uh, PIDEX taxonomy structure. But at the end of the, uh, at the end of the day, it was worth their time and effort. And it, uh, one of the things about, um, the, about uh, data quality is, is searching. So if, uh, if data, if you're not able to search for data, uh, however good the data is, uh, if it is not available, it's as good as it's not there. So, and searching, a taxonomy can help a lot uh, in, uh, in improving your searching, in better training, and uh, finally using the data to reduce duplicates as well. So, Prasant, I, yeah, I, I, I'm really glad that, you know, that question got asked. This is something for us to think about a little bit more, but I, I think there's a combined answer that says, that says, okay, well, I just challenge people to go from 1% to 2%, and, and you said, okay, taxonomy will help you do that. Correct. We, we, got, we got to put some meat around that answer, but I, I, I think that, 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 that could really be helpful to people. So let's try to do that in the next three or four weeks. Okay. What's next, Shannon? <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Yeah, we're getting lots of great questions coming in here. Uh, next question is, it's clear that data is an essential element in business strategy. In your opinion, how many companies have fielded long-term data governance programs, and why aren't more of them paying attention to this aspect of data management? Long-term? So I, look, yes. I, look I, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, I haven't done a, I haven't done a careful study but I think most data governance efforts are failing, um, and and they're 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 failing for for lots and lots of reasons. I mean, you know, look, governance is about control, and and a lot of things in the data space are out of control. Um, but you know, it's 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 just you know, control is not all that popular. I mean, you, you, people get that we want to create new revenue. Right? They get that we, we, we want to make better decisions. They get we need to innovate. And, and, um, and so, but, but, you know, well, why we need to be under better control? I mean, it's, it, it, alone, it's hard to understand that. And, and I mean, an, an overall data strategy is, is going to put them both together. It's, it, 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 it's going to link up, you know, well, how we're going to go about making more money, which of the ways that putting data to work are best for us. And, and and will you know will help us make more money and, and improve our competitive position and and then the you know and then and then the governance programs can be you know a whole lot a whole lot skinnier around you know things going on in the in, in the factory and 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 also you know then much more linked to something that everybody gets again you know again making money. Um, or you know, by the way, I say that you know, make money, and I mean, I, I I don't mean to be quite that you know narrow about it. There's lots of you know, nonprofits and, and government agencies where you know the equivalent is is you know advancing the interest of the in of, of of the agency or or the department. So, what do you think, Prasad? 
So, Tom, but, but, but the, the, the reason, one of the main reasons why I think the, the, the data governance programs are failing or being challenged is primarily because lack of focus. When I say lack of focus is uh, coming back to my earlier slides, is identifying what elements we need to govern. Uh, and that, according to me, should be the master data and the reference data. There are many projects where I have worked where the data governance team is uh, is going and telling the business about how they have to create purchase orders, how to how to post invoices. So those kind of things. This is not the job of the data governance team. The business knows their job more than better than anybody else. So your job is to help the business succeed with data by providing them quality data and ensuring that the data that is shared across the enterprise is neat and clean. And that comes by focusing on reference and master data, not on all the data elements in the enterprise. Yeah, so, so said different, we've got to do better. We've got to focus more to create greater value and we've got to spend less time doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing. Pretty, it's a pretty strong indictment of governance the way it's done in most organizations. Yeah, and, and another point about data governance is um, I personally think the security, the, the data security and the data privacy aspects are generally taken as the last step in data governance. Uh, but that could be one reason why all the effort uh, sometimes uh, gets nullified uh, due to security and privacy reasons. Yeah, you know, as we were talking about this, it's it's you know, it's like like if you do data quality right, and and you figure out you know where the errors are coming from, and and you you know you eliminate those root causes, right? I mean, it's not the way typical organizations are doing it, but it is so much easier than correcting everything, right? You know, collect correct one root cause, and you can save yourself, you know, literally tens and thousands of corrections downstream. And, 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 you know, I mean, and this is kind of a theme. A lot of the things we're doing, you know, we're kind of not right on, right on working on the most important stuff and in the most important way. And, and so the, the efforts get too big and oppressive and, and you know, and, and, and no wonder people don't like working on them with us. Well, that leads us right into our next question here. You know, what about the data retention and destruction and or archiving portion of the life cycle? There is usually no need to store all data forever, which could pose a risk to your organization. Is this encompassed in another stage or step? Okay, so if you look at the data life cycle, the, the top two bars, uh, one, on store, uh, one, one on security and one on storage, uh, is pretty much an IT function. So it should, be, yeah, this one, yeah. Uh, is pretty much an IT function. So data storage, I would I get further subclassify it as active data and other one as uh, passive or archive data, which includes all the, uh, depending on your retention policies of the company, whether it's five years or seven years, which could be uh, archived and stored. So, which might not have a, a direct impact to the running of the business operations, but it certainly has implications on compliance and sometimes even on business operations. Um, so that's why I said in the earlier uh, slides, like uh, data for business performance is a function of three things, which is analytics, or the insights, compliance, and uh, and uh, operations. Yeah. So it's uh, it is uh, the archiving and store and uh, archiving and backup is definitely part of the data lifecycle, and it it is classified under data storage. Yeah. Hey Shannon, I think we got time for one more. I think so. So, um, to, yeah, indeed. So back to the taxonomy. Um, why taxonomy creation uh, is not part of your data engineering component? Where does it belong and must it be there before starting a data engineering effort? Um, yes. The answer is yes. The first thing is that the taxonomy would be pretty much part of the data origination so when, or, and data capture. When you want to originate data in what shape and form you want to originate, and capture it is part of taxonomy, number one. And in today's presentation, explicitly, uh, data cleanse, when Tom asked me the question about how data cleansing is different from data engineering, I covered it as part of the validation. So, and validation involves um, formatting or the, the adherence to taxonomy. So taxonomy would be, long story short, taxonomy is part of the validation aspect or the data cleansing element. 
I love it. Well, guys, we are coming up right at the top of the hour here. Um, thank you so much for this great presentation and information. Again, just a reminder to all the attendees, I will be sending out a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout. And I'll, of course, send um, an email or a link for um, both Prashant's and Tom's books so that you can get more information as needed. Um, thanks, guys. Thanks so much, and thanks to all our attendees for everything that you do are participating and asking so many great questions. We just love the engagement. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending. Thank you.